So tonight we move along in our survey of the animal kingdom and um, I have one more group of invertebrates. So we've covered invertebrates from uh, peripheral all the way up through mollusca, but um, there's one group left, the echinoderms, that I haven't covered yet. And I, I waited on, on these guys for this evening because they belong to what we call a super phylum. So it's more than one phyla um, called deterostomia. And that's because both of these phyla, chordates and the echinoderms, belong to the superphylum because it has to do with in development, in their embryonic development. Remember, we talked about the gastrula stage. So in, in animal development, you there's a zygote, right, the first cell where the egg fertilizes the sperm, and then you have this period of time where that one cell divides into two, four, eight, and so on and so forth until you get to this stage, right, where you have the hollow, whoa, the hollow ball of cells, okay, and that's called the blastula, blastula, so that's common for all animals, and then as, as it goes along in development, then what happens is you have this first sort of infolding or invagination, this right here, which will eventually become um, the digestive system or digestive canal. If this first opening eventually becomes the anus, then those organisms are deuterostomes. And we, as chordates, that's us, <clears throat> we're deuterostomes, and so are echinoderms or echinoderms. So we share that with them. So let's talk a little bit about what is exactly, so these guys are invertebrates, obviously we're vertebrates, these guys are invertebrates, they do not have an endoskeleton, okay, or a vertebra column, um, but they do have five-part radial symmetry. So you can see from this C star that it can be broken up, right, into five equal parts. You see those five arms there. Okay, that's in the adult form. They actually go through a larva stage where they have metamorphosis, right, from the larva to the adult. And their larva, it actually has bilateral symmetry. So at some point in their life, they do have bilateral symmetry. Now, the, the name of their phyla is actually says spiny skin. And so you can see from the sea urchin, right, that that's, definitely a good visual of that spiny skin. Another feature of echinoderms is what we call a tube feet, which can serve as a, like suction cups to either move or grab food. Um, and these work by this internal water vascular system working with muscles to move um, these tube feet. These organisms have external fertilization where the males actually release their sperm out into the ocean water and the females release their eggs, excuse me, into the ocean water. And so the fertilization occurs there. So as you see from the pictures, some examples that belong to this phyla are sea stars, sea urchins, sea cucumbers, and then sand dollars. So that was our last um, invertebrate group I wanted to talk about. Tonight's focus is going to be on the chordates. So these, um, to be a chordate, you have to have had these four characteristics that we're going to talk about at some stage of life. So they don't have to persist into adulthood, but at some point in development, all four of these characteristics have to be true. So the first is what we call a notochord. Now, invertebrates like us, we no longer have a notochord as an adult. Instead, we have a vertebral column, right, in our spine. So this is, this notochord is replaced by a vertebral column. But in, in embryonic stages, we had this, it was present. The other characteristic, one other, is a dorsal hollow nerve cord. This develops, you know, we talked about the three germ layers last time. We have endoderm, mesoderm and ectoderm. This develops from the ectoderm and it eventually becomes part of the nervous system, so brain and spinal cord. 
for most chordates. The third characteristic is called pharyngeal slits. And um, most chordates, these don't exist right through adulthood. For example, in fish, they're going to develop into either gill or jaw supports. Um, and in tetrapods, like us, they're, they're modified into tonsils and parts of the middle and inner ear. The fourth characteristic is the tail, the post-anal tail. So for many animals, this tail serves for, for locomotion. If they're um, water-dwelling organisms, they, it may help them swim. Um, if they're land-dwelling, it may be important in balance. It, it can be used for signaling to other members of their group, for courting, attracting a mate. Um, in, in the adult form, it may be reduced. So, for example, humans, we, we don't have tails, right, at birth. All we have is a little tailbone. That's, that's all that remains. Oops. Okay. Now, there is a group of chordates that are actually invertebrate chordates. So they have all four of those characteristics that we talked about but they, they are not vertebrates. Okay. So the adult then is not moving its sessile. Um, as you see here, this is the adult form. The only of the four characteristics, the only one that remains through adulthood is the pharyngeal slits. Now the lancelet that you see here burrowed down in the sand, it retains all four characteristics into adulthood. So you can see the tail is present, um, the pharyngeal slits are present, the notochord here, and then the dorsal hollow nerve cord. Okay, moving along, um, so we move up now into chordates that are vertebrates. So they have a vertebral column. The first group we're going to talk about are the fish. And what's important that fish, how do we distinguish characteristics that are specific to fish? Well, so um, the other organisms that we've looked at up to this point have not had jaws, right? So now we have jaws, fish have gills, and they also have fins. We're going to look at two different groups of fish. The first, the cartilaginous fish. Okay, these include sharks, rays like stingrays, and, and fish called skates. They're named cartilaginous cartilaginous because their skeleton is not made of bone. Instead, it's made of cartilage. So they, there's some important features in these organisms. And the first is something called the lateral line. And this is a sense organ that's present in many fish that are able to detect vibrations. So they can either detect prey this way or um, flee from danger. Um, another characteristic or important feature is the ampullae of Lorenzini, and these, this is the name of a special sense organ that these organisms have that allow them to detect electromag electromagnetic fields. Okay, this is another way that they can sense out prey. Now, one new feature that we are seeing is internal fertilization. So up until this point, we've seen a lot of external fertilization. Now here's a term, okay, and it, not all, it, 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 in biology it seems like there's never a rule that applies all the time, and so most are ovoviviparous, which means that they have eggs, but they're retained inside the mother's body, and they hatch there, and um, they hatch in the uterus, and then live young are born fully functional able to swim and function on their own. Now that, that's most of these cartilaginous fish. Some 
are oviparous, meaning the eggs are going to hatch outside of the mother's body, and some are viviparous, which means they're, they're actually developing inside the mother's body and she gives live birth. Okay, so here's, you know, two examples. We recognize the shark and the ray on the right, both members of the cartilaginous fish. Okay, the other group of fish are the bony fish. So the majority of fish are going to belong to this group. And what are some important features? Well, they, they have a swim bladder. And the purpose of this swim bladder is to control their buoyancy, how, how um, much they sink or float in the water based on the, the gases that they allow in the swim bladder. They also have the lateral line for detecting vibrations. Um, one feature that these fish have so that they don't have to constantly swim for water to flow over their gills so that they have enough um, fresh oxygen, they, they can pump water over their gills so they do not have to constantly swim. And bony fish are broken up into two groups, ray finned fish, so almost any fish that you can think of, catfish, trout, perch, salmon, you know, all of the normal fish, swordfish that you can think of belong in this group. This is the greatest number of fish in this group. The lobed finned fish are a couple of species of fish. And what's different about these is that their fins are very fleshy with muscle and bone. So they have um, more structure in their fins than the ray finned fish. One member of the lobe finned fish are the lung fish. And they're named that because these fish actually have lungs. So they have gills, right, So because they swim in the water. But they also have lungs so that when, let's say, they're in a creek bed or something, when it dries out, they can actually burrow down into the mud and gulp air with their lungs for, for a period of time. So on the left, we see a salmon, and you can see, you know, the, the thin ray fins that, that you recognize in most fish. And then um, the seal, coelacanth is one of the lobe-finned fishes, and you can just see that these are fleshier, thicker type fins, okay? Down here is the lungfish, the one that contains the lungs, that can actually gulp air. Okay, we move up to amphibians. What should we know about amphibians? Well, amphibian means double life. And so your book talks about that as meaning that they can live in freshwater, but they also have a period of time where they live on, on land. And that's true. But the other thing is, you know, they go through but a more they go through a metamorphosis period from the larva stage to the adult. So that's also the two lives. That they have a larva stage and an adult stage. So these organisms have a three-chambered heart for, for better circulation. Now, they do have external fertilization, most of them. They lay eggs, but their eggs cannot dry out. They do not have any kind of a protective shell, so they have to be near water so that they don't dry out. Their larva stage, because they're, stay, they're in the water, have external gills, and the adults are going to have lungs, but the lungs alone don't provide enough gas exchange for them to get plenty of oxygen and to rid themselves of the carbon dioxide. Their skin actually serves as a, as a way for them to exchange gas right across their skin. So in order for the skin to function that way, they have to have moist skin. So they have a high need for fresh water to keep their skin moist. So some examples of amphibians, of course, are frogs, 
salamanders, and Sicilians. So at the top, you see on the top left, a salamander, on the right, a tree frog, and then down below, you see the double life that I talked about from tadpole to adult frog. Okay, our next group of chordates is, or are, the group is reptiles. Now I want to point out one term to you that applies to reptiles, but it applies, it applies to others also, amniotes. So these are the reptiles, the birds, which are now actually grouped in with the reptiles, and mammals like us. Okay, what is an amniote? Well, that means that the egg actually has a hard shell, so that prevents it from drying out. Remember, the amphibian eggs didn't. And the embryo inside the egg is actually protected by a special fluid in the egg called amniotic fluid. And here's a website um, that I, I think does a great job. And so um, I'm actually going to go there for just a second and share this website. And we're going to talk about it. Okay, so you should now see a screen that says introduction to the amniota. So if you're if you're not seeing that, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to assume that everybody can see it. Okay. Okay, so this this is showing us oops a picture of the amniotic egg. I'm not going to be able to draw in here. Um, so as you notice, the embryo is here. Okay. Um, the amniotic fluid is surrounding the embryo, embryo as a way of protection, okay? But there are other important features of the egg, too. We have something called the chorion, um, the allantois, the yolk sac, and you see the shell on the outside, and then the, albu the albumin, okay? Um, directly surrounding the embryo, as I mentioned, is the amnion, where you have the amniotic fluid. The allantois provides a couple functions. One of them, it, it helps with gas diffusion, okay, for the embryo, and the other is removal of waste that the embryo produces. The yolk sac is there, is, is the food for the embryo while it's developing, okay. And then the chorion essentially is like a, a, a protective barrier, right, around all of this, okay. Around the chorion, then, is the albumin, or what would be the white part of the egg. Uh, and then, finally, the outer shell, as I mentioned, that's there uh, specifically to prevent drying out. So the organisms that have this type of egg, then, will be called Let me just share my files again real quick. Amniotes, okay. All right. So that's, uh, the reptile is the first um, group that we've talked about tonight that has this type of egg. So what else do reptiles have besides um, an amniotic egg? Well, they also have scales. And so these prevent them from drying out, water loss, prevent water loss. They have internal fertilization. The crocodilians are, are one group of reptiles, and I mention them because, remember, amphibians just had three chambers to their heart. Um, and when we talk about the cardiovascular system later, we'll see that that's not as efficient, right, as, as far as gas exchange and getting nu nutrients where they need to go. So a four-chambered heart, that's what we have, is sort of a step up, right, from a three-chambered heart. So the crocodilians are the group, pardon me, of reptiles that have a four-chambered heart. So we see here four different species that belong to the reptile kingdom. Okay, a crocodile, um, a chameleon, a snake, and a turtle. As I mentioned to you, birds are considered part of the group of reptiles. 
Um, but what are some things that are specific to birds? Well, because birds need to be as light as possible because for flight, their bones are actually hollow. So that, that helps them not to be heavy so that they can um, have flight. Feathers is another characteristic which obviously we know help with flight, but they provide other things too. They, they provide insulation for the bird, even though they're endothermic, right, which means that they can use their metabolism to produce heat, right, to stay warm. Um, the, the feathers help with that by insulation, and they also use feathers to attract mates. They also have the amniotic egg, and birds have a four-chambered heart. Another interesting feature is the way that their lungs work. So as when we talk about the respiratory system, especially ours, we'll talk about that, you know, you breathe in, you inhale to your lungs, and then you exhale through the same path. Well, the, the birds have such an efficient airflow, their airflow essentially flows one way. So it's not, there's not as much dead air. Okay, they have internal fertilization. And now we hit our final group of chordates, which are the mammals. Okay, there are several characteristics that you, you should know that sort of define a mammal, and that is mammal, all mammals have hair. And hair actually does more than just help with insulation or, or keeping our body regulated. It also has a lot to do with social signaling. Um, it, it provides coloration for camouflage, right? Um, and for certain animals, the hair can actually serve as a sensor, right, to detect when there is, you know, movement or something near them. The other feature of mammals is they make milk. They feed their young with milk, and so they do this by some special glands called mammary glands. Mammals also have bigger brains, and by bigger brains, I don't just mean in size, although they are, but think about bigger brain meaning higher function or higher thinking. Another important feature of mammals is the diaphragm, which we use to breathe to draw air into our lungs. It's a muscle, right, that helps to draw air into our lungs. So mammals also, like us, some of them have something called heterodont teeth, meaning we have more than one type of tooth, right? We have our molars and our incisors and our canines because the teeth are for different types of foods. Many mammals are also diphodont, meaning like us, we had two sets of teeth. We had baby teeth, which we lost, and then we have mature teeth. Some animals will have more than two sets of teeth. They will continue to gain new sets. So we have three different groups of mammals. The ones that you're probably most familiar with are the eutherian, and these are sometimes called placental mammals because that's how they're distinguished. They have a placenta in which the baby grows, right? And the placenta connects fetus to mom, mom to fetus, and the job of the placenta is to exchange gases. So to carry oxygen to baby and get rid of carbon dioxide right out, to, to carry nutrients to the fetus, and for fluid exchange. So this is the most widespread group of mammals. We belong to this group. Um, another group, which you're probably also familiar with, are the marsupials. These are the ones that have a pouch. So primarily, the majority of these organisms live in Australia, but there are some that live other places like the possum that lives in the Americas. So you may have, we have possums, right, in Texas. So they are marsupials. So the way, the way they're different, when these young are born, they're very much less developed, certainly not able to live on their own. And so they essentially crawl up into this pouch and right there in the pouch, they will be able to receive the milk and further develop um, until they're able to leave the pouch and live on their own. The third group 
are called monotremes, and you may or may not be familiar with this group. What's interesting about this is there are actually mammals that lay eggs, and so monotremes lay these leathery eggs, so that's their amniotes, right? They lay eggs. Um, there are only three living species that fall into this category, the platypus and um, two different species of echidna or spiny anteaters. The platypus um, is in Australia, and actually there are um, anteaters in Australia and on the island of New Guinea. So we have the platypus here on the left and the echidna or spiny anteater on the right, and those are the two um, monotremes, egg-laying mammals. Okay, let's talk for just a second about primates. So primates are a group of chordates, so they, these are also mammals, right? Chordates, mammals, primates that include lemurs, tarsiers, monkeys, and apes. So humans are categorized in the ape group. And there's a term that I want you to be familiar with, brachiation. And essentially what this means is the hands and feet are adapted for climbing and swinging through the trees. So some examples of anatomy that would be, uh, that would point to this here would be a rotating shoulder, the big toe that is widely separated from other toes, the thumb that is separated from the other fingers except not in humans, and then stereoscopic vision which essentially means we have two visual fields right that overlap and this is what provides us with our depth perception. Okay the biggest of the brains right and the other interesting characteristic of primates, not always, but typically, right, we have a single baby for each pregnancy. So primates are broken up into two groups, the prosimians and the anthropoids. The prosimians include the smaller um, smaller brained primates, so bush babies, lemurs, lorises, and tarsiers. These are usually also nocturnal, besides just being smaller and smaller brained. And then the anthrop anthropoids include monkeys, what are called the lesser apes, like the gibbons, and then what are called the great apes, which includes the chimp, the bonobo, the gorilla, the orangutan.